it's electronic vehicle for us to be together. So thank you for doing so. And also for all of you for attending and being with us as a extended family this evening. We are looking, as you may recall, at the book of Hosea. And we started on Sunday and started off by showing that it's a remarkable prophecy in which the prophet is told to mirror in his personal life the relationship between God and Israel. We saw on Sunday how Hosea's wife Gomer was unfaithful to him, but through redeeming love, God told Hosea to take her back. It provides a picture of what God will do with the nation of Israel. And those facts were the themes of the first three chapters of Hosea. If you had a chance to look through those chapters of Hosea, either on Sunday or in the days following, then you'll see as we went through those chapters, you would have noticed that I left out a section from each chapter. Tonight, we are going to fill in the blanks because those sections are all interrelated and they serve well as being dealt with as one topic. Some people, when you ask them, what is the book of Hosea about, they only remember that it's the story of Hosea and Gomer and their relationship and coming back together and the good ending that it has. But that's really not the correct interpretation of the book of Hosea. The relationship between Gomer and Hosea was only to be in miniature the larger drama between God and Israel. So what we're going to do this evening is going to be a Bible study concerning the nation of Israel. It's going to be a prophetic message this evening, and it's going to cover a lot of territory. So rather than ask you to turn to each passage that I reference, I would ask you to have a pen and a piece of paper and write them down, and then at your leisure, Afterwards, you can look up the actual verses that I've referenced. But I'll start this evening in chapter 1, reading at verse 8. Hosea chapter 1, verse 8. Now when she had weaned Loruhama, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together, and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Recall that the children born in the house of Hosea signified events for the nation. The first son that was born was by the name of Jezreel, a name which means scattered. The second was a daughter, Loruhama, meaning no mercy. And the third was a son, Loami, not my people, and I will not be their God. This sequence of events signified the coming judgment when Assyria would conquer Israel, they would destroy the capital, Samaria, and carry off the inhabitants. Verse 10 looks into the future and tells us several important points that we need to keep in mind. The first is that there will be a time when the population of Israel will be reestablished and multiplied. Secondly, you will once again be my people. Thirdly, Judah and Israel will be together in that time, and they will have one ruler over them. And that will be a great day for Israel. Verse 11 says, it is the day of Jezreel. Now recall, that was the name of Hosea's first son, 
chapter 1, verse 4. The name means scattered, and it was initially given in a negative connotation, that the nation would be scattered. Here in verse 11, the same word is turned around and now used in a positive sense. I would ask you, what does a farmer do when he plants seed? He scatters it in a positive way, and it produces a great harvest. And that is the meaning here of Jezreel here in verse 11. What was originally scattered to their detriment in the future is going to be a scattering to a harvest to produce a large number of people. Now take those ideas from chapter 1, those three important points, and turn over into chapter 2 and look through verses 14 to 23 as I go through it to see that it repeats the same promise again. Verse 16 says, In that day you will call me Ishi, meaning my husband, and you'll no longer refer to me as Bali, meaning Baal, my master, the false god that they had gone after. Verse 18, I will take away warfare from them and I will let you live in peace. Verse 19 and 20, I will take you again in a marriage covenant forever in righteousness, judgment, love, and mercy, and you will be faithful on that occasion. Verse 23, those who previously were not my people will become my people again at that time. For extra emphasis, the same group of promises is made once again in chapter 3. So I'd ask you to turn over to chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. In that chapter, it's a remarkable set of verses concerning the Jewish people, for it summarizes the status of the Jewish people both at the present and into the future. Now, before you get into the verses in chapter 3, in that early part of the chapter, think of the parallel in the life of Gomer. In chapter 3, verse 3, she is redeemed and brought back to the place where Hosea has made it possible for her. She is placed in a sort of probationary status in part for cleansing, and in part to prove her. And it's stated that she will be there in many days, in verse 3, chapter 3. During this time, she will not have any more affairs. She will be celibate, and Hosea will not be intimate with her. That is the probable meaning in the Hebrew of the phrase, so will I also be for thee. In other words, I will be like other men, separated from you, until the waiting period is completed. That refers to the relationship between Hosea and Gomer that we spent time on Sunday looking at. But now it opens it up into the larger significance in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 3, where it says this same parallel will now exist for the nation of Israel and it gives the prophetic future for Israel. Just like Gomer, it says the nation will also be in a holding pattern for many days. In fact, it will be right up until the latter days, which is said at the end of verse 5. When scripture refers to the latter days, that is a phrase which takes us into the future. Verse 4 they will be without a king at that time. That was told to us already in chapter 1, or a prince. In other words, there will be no divinely appointed ruler, and that's fairly easy to understand. They will also be without a sacrifice, and without an image, says verse 4. An image meaning a standing pillar. That is the first contrast. The second contrast is they will be without an ephod, 
and without a teraphim. And when you read these verses, you say, what on earth is this talking about? The history of the Jewish people since their defeat during the time of the pro prophets, since the time of Hosea, has been without a God-ordained king. Since both Judah and Israel fell, there has never again been a political ruler over the Jews as a king or prince. Under Nehemiah and Ezra, they had leaders, but there was no king. Recall their boast to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. In the areas of religion, God has placed a hedge or a fence around them. Although God at the present has kept them separate, he, st he still preserves them and he restricts their choices so that the Jews will still exist until the time of their national restoration. How does God do that? This is what verse 4 is telling us. Verse 4 says, you will not have a sacrificial system. There will be no sacrifice. And there has been no sacrifice in Judaism since the fall of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Judaism had to dramatically change in its whole outlook on how they would worship, as they do not have a sacrificial system anymore. That is one fence that has been put on them. On the other side, God says, yet you will not ever again go to the worship of false gods. That's the images or the statues. I won't let you go back to the Old Testament sacrifices, but I also will not let you go back to the worshiping of false gods. And it is true that the Jews have never gone again worshiping false idols and false gods. That is the fence on the other side. He then says, you will not have an ephod. That was the high priestly garment containing the Urim and the Thummim to seek God's direction. He says, you will not have sacrifices. You will not have your high priest. You will not have an ephod. That's the fence on the one side. But on the other side, you will not be allowed to turn to false oracles of household gods, the teraphim. Recall that those were the household objects that Rachel stole from her father Laban in Genesis 31. Those were the household gods, still false gods. And that, in a nutshell, in that verse, summarizes Judaism for the last 2,000 years, outwardly acknowledging Jehovah, yet not understanding who he really is, not returning to a sacrificial system, and yet not deviating off to worship of a false god. God has put up a fence on either side of them to keep them and preserve them. And because they do not recognize who their Messiah is, they are really still in a holding pattern. And yet God has graciously preserved them from worshiping false gods. And as a result, as a people, they have kept their identity. That is an amazing truth. Think of all the other old cultures and old civilizations. The Philistines, where are they today? They do not exist. Where are the Assyrians? They do not exist. Where are the Phoenicians or any of these other old cultures that we have in the Old Testament? They all crumbled and fell away. But the Jews have remained protected by God because he's put a fence on either way. He will not let them go back to the old sacrifices, but he will also not let them go after false gods. And that is summarized so beautifully here in this verse 4. Without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, and without a teraphim. They will seek Jehovah in the future, verse 5. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God 
and David, their king. This is still future. They will have their true king, David, under Messiah in the latter days, going into the millennium. It is an amazing prophecy in these two verses. Based upon these prophecies of chapters 1, 2, and 3, let's review then God's plan for Israel. And we will be matching what Hosea tells us with what the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans chapters 9 to 11. God has declared that the northern nation of Israel will cease to exist. The southern nation of Judah will fall 130 years later. And at that point, God has declared as a nation, Israel as a whole is lo ami, meaning they are no longer my people. That bothered the Apostle Paul, as he would like to have seen more of his brethren converted. Paul recognized that only a handful were a faithful remnant, and that they would have a true relationship with God at the present time. That's Romans chapter 9, verses 27 to 29. Someone might ask, has God cast off the Jewish people forever? And Romans 11 verse 1 tells us, no, not at all. Any Jew who is part of the faithful remnant will be saved. Paul says there was a t- there was, that was true in Elijah's day when 7,000 still served God. Romans 11 verse 4. It was true in Nehemiah's day. And the Lord's coming, there were still a faithful remnant. Recall people such as Anna. Simeon, Elizabeth, Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, they were all involved and all included in this faithful remnant. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that the very fact that he was saved proves that the Jews have not been cast aside. When we refer to the nation, the entire Jewish nation, as God's chosen people, we need to be very careful what we mean. The vast majority of the Jewish people are not his chosen people at the present time. Since Hosea's time, God has declared them being lo ami, not my people. God's chosen people right now are those who comprise the universal church, both Jew and Gentile. A Jew does not get to heaven by a separate route. Everyone, Jew or Gentile, needs Christ as their personal Savior through faith. When they accept Christ in that way, they become part of the church. Therefore, you could I say, are some individual believing Jews his chosen people? Absolutely just as much as some Gentiles are his chosen people within the church. Romans chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, tells us that Jews are saved as individuals under the age of the church. However, Israel as a nation, as a complete group, has not obtained salvation. How long will this national rejection of Israel last? Romans chapter 11, verse 25 tells us it is until the fullness of the Gentiles has taken place. And that takes us right up until the tribulation. And then Romans 11, verse 26 tells us at that time, all Israel as a nation will be saved because they will learn and recognize Christ as their Messiah, and they will come to a place of repentance. And they will enter into the millennium in that state and in the fulfillment of the prophecies that are given here in the book of Hosea. At that time, and not before, will Israel as a nation once again be called God's chosen people. 
That's the same as the latter days spoken of here in Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. God will honor his promises to Abraham, to the patriarchs, to David, and the Jews will be his people. But it's in the future. Unfortunately, certain Christians and certain Christian literature become confused at this point. They equate the secular nation of Israel, which was founded in 1948, to mean that all of these prophecies have been fulfilled. Now, I agree that God is arranging affairs in the Middle East to accomplish his future purposes. God has shown his protective hand over Israel in such events as the Six-Day War, victory in 1967. But that does not change the fact that the nation of Israel has not yet become God's people. They have not yet returned and recognize who their Messiah is. And when certain authors refer to current Israel in those terms as the chosen people, it creates a viewpoint that Israel, because they are supposedly God's people, can do no wrong in any of their political decisions. And it gives them really a carte blanche to do whatever they want. Now, I believe that we should be allied with Israel. It is the only true democracy in the Middle East. And I also believe that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God still has his protective and overruling hand over them. He is preserving them, as we've already seen, for that future day. But when we look at the secular state of Israel, do not be confused that the secular state equals the fulfilled prophecy. If the nation of Israel violates human rights or passes legislation which is not just, we should be honest and be willing to condemn it and its actions as we would any other nation. In fact, we should be praying for the salvation of Jews as much as the salvation of other Palestinians and other Arabs in the region. For it is only in this way that they all become God's people during this age. Another false line of thinking coming from these prophecies of Hosea concerns the fate of the ancient tribe of the northern kingdom of Israel. As a political entity, they were destroyed. Yet we already read in Hosea's prophecy where he states that the people of Israel will be blessed in the future, and they, along with Judah, will come together and have one ruler. Therefore, the tribes of Israel must still exist for that to take place. Now that had led certain authors to ask, so where are the tribe of Israel now? Where are those 10 tribes? In the past, it caused some people with rather wild imagination to propose all sorts of ideas of the so-called 10 lost tribes of Israel. One group was known as British Israelites. They believed that the Israelites, once dispersed, had migrated into Europe and had become the Celts, hence the inhabitants of Britain, were also included and were their descendants. And this teaching by such men as Herbert W. Armstrong in the 1960s in the Worldwide Church of God, among others, brought this idea very prominent in his teaching, that the northern European immigrants brought the Jewish descendants to North America, and, and hence Britain and America were included. The same teaching carries on today in such congregations as the, as the Living Church of God Canada. The main reason for teaching these ideas was that you could claim all of the blessings 
promised to Israel that they could be expected and claimed by yourself and these groups. Well, without taking it any further, let me just say that whole concept is wrong. A closer look at scripture gives the correct answer. Write down 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 17, and 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 14 to 17. And it'll show you that when the northern tribes rebelled against Rehoboam, there were groups of those tribes living in the cities of Judah. They did not go into the northern kingdom, but they stayed where they were under King Rehoboam, and they remained and lived with Judah and Benjamin in the south. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, we see people of Israel still coming to worship at Jerusalem, a faithful remnant. When we move into the New Testament, we have descendants of these various tribes. Think for a moment of Mary and Joseph. They were of the tribe of Judah. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Barnabas was from the tribe of Levi. But we also have Anna, the prophetess. And which tribe is she from? She is from the tribe of Asher. That's a northern tribe. That's from the Israel. Paul refers to the 12 tribes as still existing in Acts 26, verse 7. And when the epistle of James is written, James in that book states that he is writing to all 12 tribes scattered abroad. In other words, the summary of all this is that the 10 so-called lost tribes of Israel have never been lost. They were amalgamated into the rest of the Jewish life, and God has promised to seal 12,000 from each of those tribes in Revelation 7 to survive the tribulation. During those dark days of the tribulation, two-thirds of the Jewish people in the land of Israel will be killed. Only one-third will see the salvation of the Lord. Listen to Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. Now, listen to this. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. This is exactly what Hosea has said. That is when Loami will be overturned. Up till that point, they have not been my people. Now, Zechariah and Hosea says, that will change. They will now be my people once again. And they will say, the Lord is my God. And that is the time when they will realize who their true Messiah is. And Zacharias tells us they will look on him whom they pierced. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 4 and 5 tells us that the Jews of that day will realize that he was crucified for their salvation. And they will realize that they have been redeemed by his blood. What was given in picture form of redemption between Hosea and Gomer will be acted out between God and the nation of Israel of redemption paid for by his blood. Recall that Hosea, when he redeemed Gomer in chapter 3, at the early verses that we looked at, he said to her, you will abide with me many days, and you will be purified. And after that, I will also be for thee. And that is exactly what will happen on a national level to Israel. According to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 to 14, they will be in a time of mourning. Men separate from their wives in mourning. And when that time is over, 
Then the rejoicing starts. Read Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. And that is what his Hosea has already told us in Hosea 2, verses 16 to 20 that we looked at. No more war. Everything will be at peace. Israel, or Isaiah rather, tells us the wolf, the leopard, and the lamb will be at peace with each other, with other domestic animals. God will take the Jewish nation to himself in a marriage covenant, as Hosea tells us, established upon loving kindness and mercy. And they will once again be his chosen and blessed people and enjoy that special relationship as they move on into the millennium. The Apostle Paul tells us the same truths in Romans. He has told us about the faithful remnant and how God is selecting individuals from Jewish background at the present time. And then he points us to the future when he says all Israel will be saved through faith in Christ. And as he looks towards to those promises, he's recognizing that all of the promises made to Abraham, to the patriarchs, to King David, will all be brought to pass, and God will be proven faithful. And when Paul views the overall plans of God with regards to this Jewish nation, he is overwhelmed. Listen to Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to be glory forever. Amen. Hosea was also given insight into this dealings of God with Israel. Initially, it will be Loami. You are not my people based on your sin, but ultimately, you will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will enter into this everlasting covenant with you out of redeeming love when they recognize who their Messiah is. The lesson for Hosea involved personal tragedy, but he was faithful in obeying God and as a result was given this wonderful insight as a prophet into what God would be doing, and he became God's mouthpiece to give us these wonderful prophecies that God was able and to show us the truth through his book. I hope this has been of some profit to you as we've looked at the nation of Israel and see that the book of Hosea has much more to teach us than just a domestic situation between a husband and wife. And Lord willing, on Sunday, we will go and look at some more thoughts of what this remarkable short book has to teach us. Thank you. Thank you.